You know, I'm gonna agree with Marty. I love opening title sequences. You know, the boring part at the beginning of the movie where all the names come up? I love it. Of course, this probably shouldn't be surprising since I'm the kind of weirdo who obsessively reads the credits because I love seeing the billing order of the actors and I really want to know who the cinematographer was, but beyond just the text on screen, I love the tradition of starting movies with a flourish. This big sequence introducing us to what we're about to watch. Look, I know every one of you watching this can immediately name one of your favorite title sequences. Maybe it's one from a James Bond movie, or maybe it's a Saul Bass one, like Psycho or Anatomy of a Murder, or maybe it's a more recent one, like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. There are a lot to choose from. But you may have noticed that over the past few decades, they've sort of gone out of style. Obviously, they're still around, like the day a Bond movie doesn't have an elaborate title sequence is the day we'll truly know movies are dead, but they're a lot less common than they used to be. These days, it's pretty normal for movies to have no opening titles at all. I'm looking at you, Chris Nolan. So I'm here today, taking a break from editing the season finale, to celebrate this art form and tell you why it matters more than you might think, and why I think title sequences need to come back. So basically, I'm going to be an old man and complain about how things were better in my day. Actually, that's not true. I'm going to complain about how things were better in the day before my day. So like the 60s. So before we can talk about why opening titles matter, we first need to go through, drumroll please, a brief history of title sequences. The first title sequence appeared in 1897 when Thomas Edison himself put a credit at the start of one of his films to prevent piracy. That's right, movie piracy was also a thing in the 19th century. Then in 1908, in the film Bronco Billy, G. M. Anderson became the first actor credited on screen, heralding the tradition of giving the primary credits to a film's stars. And over the next decade, the popularity of feature-length narrative films, the rise of the film industry, and the increased influence of unions for cast and crew led to the development of a standard format for opening credits that appeared before all movies. Up until the early 1950s, most opening title sequences looked pretty similar. Like this. Most of them ran just under a minute long, and would have several names at a time clustered onto a series of title cards that would appear over a static background. The aesthetics would change to fit the style of the given movie, but the general format remained the same. Like here's Casablanca, and here's An American in Paris. I need to provide some context here. See, back in the 1940s, the only way to see movies was by going to the movie theater, and the theater experience was a bit different than it is now. Back then, when you went to the movies, you didn't just watch a movie. You got a lot more than that. You would get a newsreel, a cartoon, like probably a Looney Tunes short. There would be an organ player providing live music in between programs. And then, as the organ music concluded, the lights would dim, and the projector would begin playing the opening titles of the movie onto the curtain in front of the screen as it slowly rose up. This was a clear indication of the status of film titles in the classical era. They represented a transitional moment between the cartoon, the newsreels, the trek to the concession stand, and the actual movie. Undivided attention was not required because, in the eyes of the audience, and the projectionist as a representative of the industry, the film's narrative had not yet begun. Back then, even though there are some interesting examples of artistry in title sequences, it was generally viewed as an inessential part of the film. And then, that all changed in 1954, when director Otto Preminger brought on graphic designer Saul Bass to create the titles for his film, Carmen Jones. They collaborated again the following year on The Man with the Golden Arm, and this time, the film came with a letter to theater owners requiring them to raise the curtain in front of the screen before the titles. The title sequence was now officially an essential part of the film, and this is where everything changed. Bass revolutionized the idea of what opening titles could be. 
Over the next two decades, he would create dozens of iconic sequences for movies like Vertigo, Anatomy of a Murder, North by Northwest, Spartacus, and Seconds. But beyond just Bass, the scope and ambition of title sequences exploded. This is not to say that every single movie had this big, elaborate animated title sequence. Plenty still had regular, static titles. But the mid-50s through the early 70s were a high point in the variety and artistry of title sequences. It's important to note that at this time, end credits were barely a thing. Movies just ended with the end, or maybe a brief title card listing the cast of actors. For decades, the best boys and grips and assistant editors and catering managers went totally uncredited. Then, in the 1970s, that changed, as unions negotiated to get more of the crew credited in the film. And so the credits expanded, and when the credits became too long for the opening of the film to handle, the bulk of the credits were pushed to the end. And as this was happening in the 70s, realism and naturalism came into style in cinema. So there was a pushback against the stylistic excesses of the 60s, and elaborate title sequences went out of fashion. They still showed up now and again, but it became more common to either have an abbreviated title sequence right up front, or to simply put the titles on screen over the opening scene of the movie, or maybe just over a black screen. So now that end credits existed, opening title sequences were no longer really required, and they began to decline in popularity. While there have still been plenty of notable title sequences over the last 25 years or so, particularly the work of Kyle Cooper on films like Seven, Mission Impossible, and Spider-Man, opening titles have largely gone out of style. The best example of the 21st century approach to opening titles is, unsurprisingly, in the movies of Christopher Nolan, which largely set the trend of skipping the titles altogether. For all the bombast of Nolan's movies, he takes a really ultra-minimalist approach, usually with no text at all at the start, and then when the movie ends, simply cutting to the title in white text on black. Bam. Inception. The common approach for modern blockbusters is to have minimal titles up front, maybe 10 seconds long, and then a big, elaborate, animated title sequence at the end of the movie. So this is what you'll see in just about every Marvel Studios movie. The site Art of the Title, dedicated to, you guessed it, the art of title sequences, publishes an annual ranked list of the 10 best title sequences of the year. And in the past decade, each year, usually only two or three come from movies. And look, I love television title sequences too, but they function a bit differently since they're designed to be seen every single week in front of a new episode as a sort of familiar ritual. In the 90s, Steven Spielberg reportedly conducted surveys and found that moviegoers generally disliked opening title sequences. Now, if you'll excuse some editorializing, which I assume you will because this is my channel and presumably you came to hear what I have to say, sometimes audiences have dumb opinions. So let's talk about why title sequences are good, actually, and why they matter. My initial thoughts about what a title can do was to set the mood and the prime underlying core of the film's story, to express the story in some metaphorical way. I saw the title, as a way of conditioning the audience so that when the film actually began, viewers would already have an emotional resonance with it. The opening title sequence is essentially like the hype man or the warm-up comic for the movie itself. Like Bass said, it conditions the audience for what they're about to watch. It establishes the tone and foreshadows elements of the film to come. So let's compare Hitchcock's title sequences from before and after he started collaborating with Bass. The opening of Rear Window, yes, does feature the titular window, but there is zero indication that this is a thriller involving murder. Based on this, it could honestly be a comedy. And then look at Psycho. With the fractured text and sharp lines cutting across the screen, you have a much clearer idea of what you're in for. The audience is already on edge before the story has even begun. It's a similar effect with Kyle Cooper's titles for Seven. 
The glitchy editing, the extreme close-ups of razor blades, dead skin, and the killer's notebooks immediately establish the grisly, unsettling tone. So honestly, my favorite Saul Bass sequence is in Grand Prix, or Grand Prix, if you want to be French about it. The opening focuses on the minutia of the Formula One cars getting prepped before the race taking the tiny details, nuts being tightened, tire pressure gauges, and then explodes them out into kaleidoscopic split screens, putting us in the heads of these men whose lives are consumed by the art of car racing. The extreme tight shots build a sense of pressure over the opening, so then we get this huge cathartic release when the sequence ends and the race begins. The opening titles for Monty Python and the Holy Grail are pretty much an entire comedy sketch done entirely in text, but it also establishes the fourth wall breaking that will continue for the rest of the movie. And then Do the Right Things titles are this explosion of energy, with Rosie Perez dancing to public enemies fight the power in front of a set resembling a residential Brooklyn street. And it immediately tells us that this movie is going to be aggressive, stylish, sexy, and political. Now look, I could go on all day explaining why a hundred of these sequences are cool, but I want to point out some of the other narrative functions that they can serve. Spider-Man 2, also designed by Kyle Cooper, uses its opening titles to recap the events of the first movie via a series of Alex Ross paintings, which is also a nice nod to its comic book roots. By far the best part of Zack Snyder's Watchmen adaptation is its opening title sequence, which uses these extreme slow-motion visuals to establish the alternate history of superheroes in this world. Lord of War's opening titles are essentially an entire short film, a dark satire about the weapons industry, and it makes its statement so effectively that the actual movie that follows ends up feeling a little redundant. Okay, now I want to go back to something I talked about earlier, the old-fashioned experience of going to the movies, like in the 40s, with a cartoon and an organ player and all that. I think opening title sequences are a way of preserving that feeling of the ritual of going to the movies. Without them, there is this element of showmanship being lost. The difference? Showmanship. Each title sequence for the Pink Panther films takes the form of an animated cartoon. My personal favorite is the one for the third movie, The Return of the Pink Panther, which is designed by legendary animator Richard Williams. These sequences, usually about four minutes long with absolutely zero connection to the plot of the movie, feel like a way of continuing the old tradition of getting a cartoon before the movie. How can you not be romantic about going to the movies? Now, if you spend any time in places where people complain about movies, places like Reddit or Twitter or right here on YouTube, you'll be aware that modern audiences, or at least the vocal online ones, tend to care about plot over all else. They care a lot about plot holes and plot logic, and they hate filler episodes of the TV shows they watch. And taking all this into account, it's no wonder that title sequences went out of fashion. These are purely aesthetics and style and tone and theme and absolutely no plot whatsoever. This is all stuff that dudes on Reddit will tell you is cheesy, forced, and immersion-breaking, because they're boring, and most people don't want to see them. And, you know, those are valid opinions, but if I may offer a counterpoint, this is art we're talking about. And in art, aesthetics and style and tone and theme kind of matter a lot. Plus, they're cool as hell. Like, what kind of monster would skip over the intro to do the right thing? Honestly. I don't think it's a coincidence that what I would argue are the two best MCU movies, the two Guardians of the Galaxy movies, are two of the only ones they've made with opening title sequences. Even when the title sequence is technically part of the story of the movie, by nature of it being the title sequence, it allows the movie to get away with taking its time on a sequence not relevant to the plot. Like, Spielberg is able to do a whole musical number at the start of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom because, hey, it's the title sequence. You can do that. 
A cinematic tradition that has almost entirely died out is the overture, something carried over from opera and musical theater, in which the film would begin with a few minutes of just music. As the audience gets settled, the film introduces them to its main musical themes. This was never really all that common, since it was usually only in huge three-hour-long movies that also had intermissions, ones like Dr. Zhivago. As Adrian Bernhardt wrote a few years ago in The Atlantic, in a culture that seems intent on eradicating boredom in all its forms, the Overture's virtual obsolescence might have as much to do with box office economics as with a fear of open-endedness. Given no option but to sit and wait, audiences quickly grow restless. But the film Overture is in fact a respite from distraction, even as it's an occasion for distractibility. These opening sequences offer the chance to rediscover music as a kind of cinematic storytelling, to think about the ways form dictates content, or to simply reflect. For moviegoers, the Overture is a bridge between real life and the story they're about to enter. Filmmakers should consider bringing it back. And part of why I love opening titles is that they sort of function as the overture. There are usually two to four minutes of purely visuals set to music, giving us a chance to focus on the musical score before the story kicks in. And as Bernhard said, have a bridge between real life and the story. Okay, so now that we're deep enough into this video, I think I can throw out this crazy theory that I have. See, there's been a lot of talk for the past decade or so about the decline in memorable, hummable movie scores. Like, every year there are still plenty of great scores, but pretty much none of the big blockbusters have music you can remember like they used to. Like, we're not getting a lot of Indiana Jones themes anymore. And I believe that there is a direct correlation between the decline of opening title sequences and the decline of memorable movie themes. Because with an opening title sequence, we're just sitting there for the first few minutes listening to the music, focusing on the score, and the composer is giving us the big main theme for the movie to really make an impression right up front. For example, let's just look at the superhero genre. In that genre, what would you say are the most memorable movie themes ever written? I'll tell you. Superman the Movie by John Williams, Batman by Danny Elfman, and then maybe a pretty distant third, Spider-Man, also by Danny Elfman. And all of those movies start with big opening title sequences where the very first thing we hear is this theme music. These are an opportunity to give these movies a musical identity, and for almost 20 years, they've been squandering it. Like, I honestly do not understand the choice to give every MCU movie this big fancy animated title sequence at the end, because that's when we're all turning to our neighbors and talking about the movie we just watched, and we're not paying attention anymore. If you're going to go to the trouble of making a whole big title sequence, put it up front where we're actually going to see it. Come on. We're in an era where, especially thanks to the pandemic, movie watching has become increasingly dominated by streaming, and the lines between movies and TV get blurrier every day. Chains like AMC continue to struggle to find ways to emphasize why the theater experience is special. And look, I am obviously not saying that opening title sequences are going to save movie theaters, but I do think that they could help make the experience just a little bit better. Because when I go to see a movie, I'm not in a huge rush to get to the plot. I'm happy to take my time and hear some music and maybe see a cartoon and let the movie spend a few minutes hyping me up for what I'm about to watch. So I say, let's bring back that sense of showmanship. And yes, of course, we're going to have a title sequence in the finale. It's a diegetic one, so the titles appear over the actual movie, but it is specifically designed to be the title sequence because, come on, we gotta do it. And obviously, if you want to see that title sequence and the finale, you've got to sign up for Nebula. You knew this was coming. 
It's a platform that I helped build along with a lot of the best creators on YouTube to make bigger projects that we wouldn't be able to make on YouTube, projects like the season finale. Plus, all of our regular videos are there with no ads. Like this ad read right here, it's not in the version on Nebula. That version has an extended cut where at the end I rank my top 10 opening title sequences. And Nebula has even more title sequence talk. There is an entire series with 35 episodes called Working Titles, where each episode has a different creator analyzing a different TV show title sequence. I did the one on the 90s animated X-Men show. And like, the lineup is incredible. H-Bomber Guy did True Detective, Polyphonic did Game of Thrones, Just Right did Batman the Animated Series. Look, there's a lot of episodes and they're pretty great. And everything we're doing on Nebula is made possible because we've partnered with Curiosity Stream, the great streaming service focused on nonfiction programming that has thousands of great documentaries. I spent a lot of time in this video talking about designers like Saul Bass, and I would recommend watching the Curiosity Stream documentary Eames, the architect and the painter, about Charles and Ray Eames, some of the most important designers of the 20th century. So anyway, we've teamed up with Curiosity Stream to create a bundle. So when you sign up for Curiosity Stream at the link in the description, or go to curiositystream.com slash Patrick H. Willems, you will also get a Nebula subscription totally free. And right now, an annual subscription, which gets you both streaming services, is only $14.79 for the entire year. So this benefits you because you have tons of great stuff to watch and it helps this whole community of creators, including me, to be able to keep taking risks and making work that we're excited about. Okay, that's it. Video over, roll credits.